Ukrima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba, historian and author Robin Binks, joins me to discuss his book titled It's Our Land You Want, The Never-Ending Struggle for Land, Cattle and Power. Your book covers stories between 1852 and 1918. So briefly tell us more about the characters of Andres Pretorius and Hendrik Porchiter during the turbulence in the Transvaal. Well, they were always uh, rather contentious figures. They had a, a, a lifelong rivalry, uh, which started much earlier when they were both on the Great Trek in 1835 onwards. And both really saw themselves as the leaders of the Boer people, the Afrikaners. Eventually, they made their peace in 1852 at the uh, signing of the Sand River Convention, but there was always rivalry between them. Pretorius, in the end, dominated uh, and was slightly more powerful than Portita, but Portita had his own followers. And in those days, the Afrikaner people uh, were very fractionalized in that they owed allegiances to certain of the leaders uh, and there was no sort of compromise. It wasn't uh, necessary that they disliked the, uh, the, uh, the, the leader that they didn't support. It was just that they preferred one above the other. And you stated that this book took you seven years to complete. So tell us more about the research involved in putting this book together. Well, seven years is a little bit um, of a... I suppose, exaggeration in that I wasn't writing every day for seven years, Toby. Um, there would be times when I didn't write, um, but I commenced the writing seven years before the publishing date, so the time span was seven years to complete it. Um, I researched the book by going to the Cape Town archives as well as the South African archives in Pretoria, uh, as well as, as other uh, primary sources such as diaries and uh, the like. Um, but most of my references were from other books and other sources. So call them secondary sources rather than primary sources, although there were primary sources involved. And can you tell us more on how Louis Botha left home, leaving Jan Smarts behind in England after the Treaty of Versailles was signed? At that time, after the Great War, as it was known, and the drama with General Smuts in that Smuts felt that the Allies were imposing too harsh a penalty on Germany. And uh, in fact, was quite outspoken in his criticism of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, he and Boerta, having both been, I suppose, victims of oppressor, in their case, England, uh, and being the losers in a war, both identified very strongly with Germany and and uh, what Germany was feeling at the time in terms of the ganging up, if you like, of the uh, European nations against Germany and the imposition of extremely harsh conditions to the Versailles Treaty. And Boerta, Boerta came back to South Africa and left Smuts, but a rather disillusioned Smuts and one who was by some accounts criticized by the British media as being a sellout and uh, almost a traitor, having, having glorified him um, in earlier years after the, the war and for the role that he played in formation of the Commonwealth and uh, his role as a member of the war cabinet, of the British war cabinet, the public mood swung against him because of his outspoken criticisms of the Treaty of Versailles. Smuts stayed behind, and at the same time, a terrible thing happened. We had the, the Spanish flu, which really started in America, 
and uh, was then transported to to Europe um, by the Doughboys, as they called them, who were the troops going across, and uh, quickly spread throughout the whole of Europe and uh, eventually to South Africa as well, where thousands and thousands died. Probably in total, far more people died in the Spanish flu throughout the world than died uh, from COVID throughout the world. Now, that gives you an idea of, the, of, of how bad the Spanish flu was. And can you briefly explain to us how the event of Bota's passing heralded a new and turbulent period for South Africa? After his passing, of course, we were left with Smuts. And Smuts had alienated so many of his own people over the years by being uh, too forgiving, in their opinion, of what the English had done, and too English. Uh, in fact, Bota was the uh, subject of the same kind of criticism. But after his passing, it wasn't long before Smuts himself came under attack from his own people and ultimately led to the fall of the more liberal, for want of a better word, and if you can judge it in the context of his times, when I say liberal in today's concepts, that, that could be slightly right of Genghis Khan, um, but at the time it was considered liberal. And it, it, uh, he had alienated the mainstream of Afrikaners because of his liberal attitude and his um, cooperation with England by taking the country into World War I with the invasion of Southwest Africa or German Southwest Africa. And then um, in, in various other ways, and it led then ultimately to the right wing becoming far more powerful and ultimately winning the elections of 1948. And we all know what happened after that. And talk to us more on why after weeks of the Jemson raid, Dr. Jemson was handed over to the governor of Natal who sent him to England to stand trial. Well, that was really the connection with, uh, with England. Um, at that time, of course, 1895, the Transvaal Republic was still independent of, of England. And um, the connection was, the closest connection was the governor in Natal. But uh, he was really only carrying out the, the bidding of um, that man called Cecil John Rhodes, who probably created or contributed to many of the bad things that we don't enjoy today it was started by Cecil John Rhodes and the Jamison raid, of course, being his downfall and the most uh, visible signs of his colonial aspirations. And can you tell us more about the events on how Jan Smart was anxious to reduce tensions between Britain and the Transvaal and he struck up an amicable relationship with Sir Percy Fitzpatrick. Percy Fitzpatrick, of course, played a role as one of the eight Londoners, one of the foreigners in the uh, Jamison raid and was involved. But he uh, was very much a proud South African in his own right. And I think Smuts identified with that and recognized that. And the two, uh, to an extent, buried their past differences and became, if not friends, certainly uh, re respected each other's positions. And why is the land issue so important now, nearly 30 years since the downing of democracy? And how has the land reform policies changed over the years? Unfortunately, the land reform policies don't seem to have changed very much. Um, it's an issue that has been with us uh, since man first came to Southern Africa. And uh, it doesn't matter who was involved, whether it was the Zulus against themselves or the Kosa against the Zulu or the Zulu uh, against other people or the Matabili. Uh, it was all about land and possession of land. 
And it's quite an interesting point. You'll hear many people will say that the land, of course, belonged to the Khoikhoi and the Khoisan, but that both those people uh, were nomadic uh, and moved around, um, and the land, they used the land, but they didn't. They occupied the land, and that period or era or area that they occupied changed. It wasn't static. So, you know, the argument of, well, it all goes back to the, the Khoi Khoi and the Khoi San, I think, is a little bit hollow. The land issue has remained a contentious issue and still does to this day. So I don't think that it's changed at all. I mean, obviously, it's changed from um, the early years of the Glenn Gray Act in 1861, I think it was, um, and that was really the, I would call the cornerstone of, of separate development and, and uh, the allocation of 7.2% of, of the surface area of South Africa to 90% of its population in the first Land Act of 1913. So uh, the only thing that has changed is that, that uh, the areas that were allocated for specific use by black people and by white people has fallen away. But the ownership of the land issue has, has not been resolved. And lastly, Robin, what are you hoping people take away after reading this book? I'm actually very proud of the book because it's a story of our people. And I think that it's very objective. I think it also covers all the people rather than one sector. So what I hope that people take away from the book is that they have maybe a better understanding of the past and how the past, the roles that different people played in the past and how they were affected by the past. And South Africa is really, uh, our history is a, a crucible where uh, uh, it, it really forged the people of today based on on the history. And the book itself, although it's a history book, is very much a story book because I was very fortunate that in that period that you mentioned, which was 1852 to 1918, there were incredible events that took place, which I have interpreted in story fashion throughout the book. So... Although people um, see it as a history book, and obviously uh, I hope that it's an educational book, it's also one of high entertainment value because of the stories. And there's stories like Norn Kwais, which many people are unaware of, the story of the Tlosa people and the decimation of the Tlosa nation, the story of uh, the discovery of gold, the first Boer War. Many people are not even aware that there were two Boer Wars or South African wars, as they call today. Uh, and that's an incredible story. And it, the book illustrates the bravery and the fortitude of all the people. You know, they, without exception, there were no, uh, in my opinion, bad guys. Everybody was a good guy. It doesn't matter who was fighting who. <laughs> they were all fighting for what they believed in. Um, and it usually came down to land. That was Robin Binks speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about It's Our Land You Want.